Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Legal and Investigative Research on a Budget, presented by Carol Levitt and Mark Roche. My name is Stephanie Phelan, and I'm a Marketing Manager at MyCase, and I'll be your host today. I'd like to first give you a few tips about participating on GoToWebinar today. The Webinar Control Panel is on the right-hand side of your screen. This is where you may submit questions and where you'll be able to see polls come up throughout the presentation. We save all of your questions until the end of the presentation. That's when Carol and Mark will answer what we've collected throughout the webinar. Also, please note that these slides will be available by end of day tomorrow on the MyCase blog, and it will also be emailed to all registrants. Today's webinar is hosted by MyCase, so before we jump into things, I'd like to give you a quick overview. MyCase is a web-based law practice management software that takes care of your daily practice requirements for calendaring, contact management, document management and templates, time and billing, client communications, custom workflows, and more in one solution at an affordable price. MyCase is priced for solo and small firms at just $39 a month per attorney and $29 a month per paralegal or support staff. We also offer MyCase websites for our customers. We use a modern, professional design built for your firm. The websites contain social media and blog integration, and best of all, complete integration with MyCase practice management software. Now you and your customers can log into MyCase directly from your website. Last but not least, we enjoy hosting educational events for professionals in the legal industry, and that is why we're all here today. Now let me tell you a little bit about our presenters. Carol Levitt and Mark Roche are principals of Internet for Lawyers. Since 1999, Internet for Lawyers has provided law firms, corporations, and local and state bar associations around the country with professional and entertaining CLE programs. Internet for Lawyers focuses on delivering information about free investigative and background research resources available on the Internet. Prior to founding Internet for Lawyers, Carol Levitt worked as an attorney, a law librarian, and as a law school faculty member. Since starting the Internet for Lawyers, she has presented hundreds of seminars teaching legal professionals the advantage of conducting investigative, legal, and business research via the Internet. Vice President Mark Roche has 20 years of traditional marketing experience. Prior to co-founding Internet for Lawyers, he was head of a major cable television network public relations department. He is active in the ABA Law Practice Management section, serving on its ABA Tech Show Planning Board and previously on its Education Committee. Thank you so much for being here today, Carol and Mark. I am going to hand the mic over to you now. Thank you. I'm Carol Levitt, and I want to give you a little bit of information about uh, some logistics for today. The first thing is you will be receiving California CLE credit and you will be getting an email from my case and it will give you all the information on how you can get your California credit. Now for those of you who are not in California, you might be able to send the certificate to your state bar. There are 50 different bars with 50 different rules, so Mark and I cannot tell you which bars will accept it and which ones will not. Um, you will need to go online and look it up on your bar site or maybe contact your bar and we hope you'll be able to get credit in your state. Um, Mark and I are CLE speakers. We spend all of our time going around the country doing seminars, so we hope you can come see us in person. Uh, we will be actually in Seattle on November 14th, Cincinnati on November the 20th, Albuquerque December the 3rd, and Illinois on December the 12th. And if you go to our website, netforlawyers.com, you will see all kinds of information about where we're going to be presenting next year. Now, this seminar is sort of a two-parter. Part of it is based on the Internet Legal Research on a Budget book that I wrote for the American Bar Association. And part of it is also about investigative research, and that is based on the Cyber Sleuth's Guide to the Internet book that Mark and I have written together. Both books are available to you for a discount, and you'll be getting an email about that. So let's talk about legal research. Um, why did I write this book? Well, I've been teaching lawyers how to use free sites for about 15 years 
And in 2013, the ABA had um, surveyed lawyers in their legal technology survey report, and they found out that 96% of you are using online research, but many of you are not satisfied with the free research. So I decided to write this book to help you use the free research, uh, make it easier for you, less frustrating, and to save you money. And so we'll be talking mostly about free sites today. So let's take a look at the next slide. So to make this presentation a little bit less like law school uh, and dealing uh, exclusively with legal research, we're going to start out taking a look at how we can use the free resources available on the internet for investigative research. And this is the, the portion of the presentation that comes from our other book that Carol mentioned, The Cyber Sleuth's Guide to the Internet. Because we're going to talk about resources that are available for free or low cost on the internet, uh, anyone who has internet access, uh, either via a desktop or laptop computer or some web-enabled device, whether it's a, a smartphone or a tablet, can access these resources. There was a time when you needed to have very specialized tools, like a shoe phone or a two-way wrist TV, but now our smart devices are... are Android phones and tablets and iPhones are our two-way wrist TVs. We're able to access any of this information anywhere we have uh, an internet signal, whether it be Wi-Fi or cellular. So let's start out by taking a look how we can use one of the most popular research, research resources on the internet to find information about people and companies, and it's Google. Uh, the thing about Google is that you just got that one search box on the home page. We'll talk a little bit about ways that we can use that search box and other tools that Google makes available to create more sophisticated, more targeted searches. So we're going to start out actually running a search for an individual uh, by the name of David Dadon. This is an individual who came to our attention a number of years ago when we received a phone call from an attorney um, asking if we could possibly serve as uh, consulting expert witnesses to explain to either a jury or a finder of fact how easy it would have been for this lawyer's uh, client's first attorney to have done due diligence uh, on an individual who the client uh, had inquired of the first attorney whether or not it would be a good idea to invest a quarter of a million dollars in a film to be produced by this individual, an individual by the name of David Dadon. So we are going to do what many people do when they're looking for background information on people. We're going to Google his name. Uh, Google has become a verb, I'm sure, much to the chagrin of the GCs uh, at Google, but that's what we're going to do right now. And you'll notice that we've entered our uh, subject's name in quotation marks because we're instructing Google to search for his name as an exact phrase. We want his first and last name in this exact order with no middle name or middle initial. And we're doing that because we, uh, we know from other uh, sources, other documents that we've read that David Dadon does not use a middle name or middle initial. So we're narrowing our search for just first and last name David Dadon. And as we look down the search results list, we get a number of different kinds of information that can help us inform our client whether or not it would be a good idea to go into business with uh, David Dadon to produce a film. So right there at the very beginning of our search is uh, the biography of David Dadon, film producer from imdb.com. This is the Internet Movie Database because David Dadon has produced a number of films and some of his credits are listed here on the IMDB site. So as we collect this information, we'll separate it into sort of three categories. Uh, piles of information, yes, he's a bona fide film producer and is someone who you might want to be in business with. So we'll put this in that yes pile. The next result isn't quite as clear. This is an SEC filing from a company called Brookmount. And in their filing, they've listed David Dadon as a plaintiff. Apparently, he's suing the company, claiming that he was terminated from their board of directors without proper procedure. This is we're going to put into the no pile, or I'm sorry, into the maybe pile, and see if we can find some additional information uh, about this situation to determine whether it's a, a yes or no. 
And then as we continue down our list of results, we see this uh, press release announcing a ruling from a court in Arizona that bars David Dadon and his son Jacob from operating publicly held companies. We're going to put this in the no pile. And as we continue on our research online, we'll see which of those piles is biggest at the end of our research and will give us an idea how we might better advise a client. Now this is the search, or these are the search results that we received when we first ran our search for background information about David Dayton. If you were to run a search uh, for his name as a phrase today, one of the very first sites that you would find is this one, the David Dayton Due Diligence Resource Center. Now you're probably not going to be lucky enough to have a research subject who has an entire website devoted to information uh, from the public record in various court cases filed against that person. Uh, here we see uh, a number of uh, orders, including this one where uh, David Dadon and his son Jacob were found guilty and, uh, uh, and are each adjudicated to serve six months less one day imprisonment in jail. Hmm, that might go in the no pile. You'll also see that there's a very strong disclaimer that the owners of this site are presenting no opinion about David Dadon or his family, and I'll say that uh, neither Carol or I are either, but all of this information comes from the public records and various allegations and rulings either for or against the Dadon family. Uh, also, we have access to uh, PowerPoint presentations that were used as exhibits at trial, uh, in some cases briefs, depositions, and video de depositions that uh, are available to play in full. Uh, if you visit that site, you'll be able to play them. They don't play very well in the GoToMeeting presenter uh, presentation software, so we're not able to show that to you right now. So Mark, I want to talk a little bit about public libraries since I am a librarian. Um, you can get a lot of information remotely from your home or your desk computer if you have a library card. So you should all, as your homework assignment today, visit your library website. If you don't know your library's address, you can look it up at livedex.com. And when I say address, I mean the web address. You don't have to go to the library to use an incredible amount of free and useful databases that they offer to you as long as you have a library card. And sometimes you have to get uh, a PIN number example of some free databases from the Los Angeles Public Library. And almost every public library offers either the same databases or similar ones. The trick though to finding them is digging them out of the library's website because every library calls them something different. This is a screenshot of the Los Angeles Public Library. And first in order to find these databases you have to uh, click on the collections and resource tab and then the research and homework tab before you actually get to the list of databases that they have available. So look for uh, keywords like research or homework or databases uh, or remote resources on your library's webpage to uh, find these resources at your library. Now if you have a Los Angeles Public Library card you can have access to 166 databases and these are magazine articles, newspaper articles, uh, encyclopedias, all kinds of directories, business background information, some people finding information like Reference USA, just a phenomenal amount of information. Most libraries will give you uh, options to access the databases uh, that they make available on their site. Most of them are available remotely from home without having to visit the library, as Carol mentioned, but some of them uh, will only be available in the library or at certain branches. And usually there's a key or a legend to explain which are available where. Almost all libraries will give you the ability to browse the collection of databases by topic. And usually there'll also be an alphabetical list of all of the databases by name so you can scroll through and see what's available at your library. So Mark, let's run some of these searches and see what we can find for free about David Data on using our library card. So one of the first results that we find uh, is an article in the Variety Entertainment Trade newspaper. Uh, we said earlier that David Data on has produced a number of films uh, and apparently while he was attending a film festival in London, he was arrested and charged with one count of unlawful confinement and three counts of indecent assault. Now this comes from 
a database called uh, Biography and Context. It used to be called the Biography Resource Center. Uh, now we could go to Variety and search their site and their archives, but in order to get full uh, or access the full text of their articles, we would have to pay either a, a monthly fee or an individual fee for the article. Here we can get it from the library for free. So we'll, we're able to read some more background information about data. We're going to put this in the no pile, maybe not someone that our client would want to be in business with and see what else we find as we continue through the other databases that are available at the public library. Another popular database available at public libraries is called InfoTrack. It's also called OneFile or General OneFile. Whatever they call it, it's the same database. It includes information from uh, numerous newspapers, uh, periodicals, and other sources, as well as uh, the archives of companies like Business Wire and PR Newswire that companies can use to distribute news about themselves. So here we see a press release from September 2003 from a company called Valcom. And they're announcing that they have signed a deal with David Dadon to serve uh, as an advisor to their company to help turn around their business because uh, he has a lot of experience in this area and they say quote we have been very fortunate to find such an individual as David Dadon because he is qualified and highly respected in the entertainment industry well there's one for the yes pile it sounds like they're very happy to be in business with David Dadon however here's another press release from a different company this was issued through PR Newswire and this is from a company called Hairmax where the uh, CEO of the company uh, is announcing that the moves by David Dadon, who he describes as the self-appointed chairman of the board of directors, were illegal, unauthorized, and without precedent in the history of the company. He also went on to characterize his behavior as just downright bizarre. We're going to put this in the no pile and see what else we can turn up. Here we see from some of, or from one of the many newspaper databases that are available at public libraries, we see an interview with the uh, chief executive of Hairmax, in which he claims that he was duped by David Dadon, uh, duped into turning over a large number of shares in his company to Dadon. In return, Dadon was to receive a seat on their board of directors, and Hairmax was to receive. Uh, a percentage ownership in a film that Dadon was to produce. Uh, over time, the article describes how the film was not produced and Dadon refused to return the shares to Hairmax or their board. So we're going to put this in the no pile. And certainly, if uh, we came to a situation where the, the client, who in the situation uh, where we come to meet them, is preparing to sue their first attorney for malpractice because it doesn't appear as if that first attorney did any due diligence like this before advising the client that it would be a good investment to uh, uh, invest a quarter of a million dollars with Dadon. We have additional individuals who we've read have direct experience with Dadon and his business practices and can testify to that. Now here as we continue in the general one file database we see as late as January 2005 the good folks at Valcom were still happy to be in business with David Dadon. In fact, they appointed him chairman of their board of directors. Apparently, he didn't have to do it himself, as was alleged by the, uh, the chief executive of Hermax. But here, in this press release, Valcom tells us a lot of useful information about Dadon, including his personal background, the fact that he's married, the number of children he has, and their relative ages at the time of this press release. Knowing the names uh, or the ages, or relative ages of an individual's uh, children can be very useful uh, if we're looking for a missing person. Uh, if we're unable to find David Dadon, we might be able to find either his children or uh, his spouse, knowing that he's married. We know one of his sons is named Jacob, and we have uh, uh, pictures of uh, David Dadon and his family members from the Due Diligence Resource Center to help us decide whether some of the information we find online is related to the same person or just someone who has the same name. And always keep in mind, regardless of how unusual you might think someone's name is, you will almost always find someone with the same first and last name and occasionally even the same middle name or initial. 
Uh, my name is not all that common. However, there are six Mark Roshes living in the United States today, and one of them shares my middle initial. So when you're looking for information about people online, it's very important to be able to uh, cross-reference and cross-check to make sure that the information is actually about the person who you're looking for and not just someone with a similar name. Also included in this press release is a list of films that David Dadon produced. And he has produced actual films like this one called Very Mean Men with Matthew Modine, Martin Landau, Ben Gazzara, and Scott Bayo. Yes, TV's Chachi has appeared in one of David Dadon's films. Now, one of the other great sources for information about people online are their own websites. Now, granted, the information might be a little bit biased, but the information can be very helpful. Uh, and in fact, a number of lawyers have told us that they've been able to use information, particularly on expert witnesses' own websites, in which they describe either their background, uh, their experience, or their processes. The attorneys have been able to use that information uh, as part of their cross-examination of the experts uh, in instances where the expert has perhaps overstated their qualifications or the process that they go through to come to uh, a determination. One of the things that we found on Dadon's own website was another one of the films um, that he produced. Uh, and this is actually, this is the film that was the subject of the original investment uh, that the client had contacted the second attorney about uh, suing their first attorney for malpractice over. And that was a film called Bad, Bad Men, which probably should have been red flag number one. Um, but then as we looked further down the list of films on Dadon's uh, website, we saw another film called Innocent Man that he produced. Now, we're not sure if there's some sort of autobiographical trilogy here, but these are actual films uh, that he has produced. And, of course, it's always important to keep in mind that the information that we're going to be looking at uh, primarily about David Dadon uh, are all allegations. These are uh, from various publicly available sources. Uh, as well as cases filed against Dadon and claims made against him. However, if one sees the same claims made repeatedly in multiple actions and multiple filings from different people, if they all end up in the same no pile, then maybe that will give us an indication how we should advise our client. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about PACER. When we're doing due diligence and background research on people, we always like to check their litigation history. Now, you could go to a case law database like Lexis or Westlaw, FastCase, CaseMaker, or Google Scholar, and you could get some information about the person you're searching. However, not many cases actually get reported, but all cases at least start out with a complaint. They're filed. So oftentimes I find nothing when I'm looking for case law research and I found a plethora of information about the person when I search dockets. Now you should search your state dockets and your federal. The federal docket database is PACER. I'm not going to talk about state docket databases because there are 50 of those and of course you would probably need to check different county uh, databases. So we'll just look at PACER for our example. PACER is our federal court docket database. Anyone can get a subscription to it. You don't even have to be an attorney. It doesn't cost anything to subscribe. It only costs to use it. And PACER lays out their costs for you. It's 10 cents a page for most of the searches, not all of them. Now, PACER covers federal district courts, federal courts of appeal, and federal bankruptcy courts. And when I'm doing due diligence on a person, I'm also looking very closely at their financial background. So looking at the bankruptcy dockets is really helpful. Um, if you look at the next slide, this is something that just happened uh, on August the 10th to PACER. And PACER updated their database. And when they did that, some of the courts, um, their databases were not compatible with the new PACER update. Now, most of you probably don't realize this, but PACER is actually a collection of 214 different court databases, all sort of joined together, but not completely integrated. So some of them just didn't work well with the new um, PACER upgrade. So now there these, are your filing fees at work. 
<laughs> so I want people uh, to look at this and make a note of it and you'll get our slides you don't have to write any of this down but a lot of the PACER documents older ones are missing now the good news is they're coming back in October if you'd like to read a little bit more information about what happened and when they're coming back and what part of them are coming back please click on this link uh, once you get your information from us so let's take a look at PACER and what do you know about PACER? Well, one thing that maybe some people don't know is we can search all the courts together if we use the PACER case locator. It is an overlay over all of the courts and you see the tabs at the top and you could click on appellate or bankruptcy or civil or criminal, multi-district. We're going to click on all courts. When I'm doing background research on someone, I don't have any idea of where someone might have filed a lawsuit against them or where they would have filed against. So I'm going to search all federal courts together. And notice I can search by party name and make a note that you enter the party name exactly the way I did. Last name, date on, comma, David. And you actually have to put the comma in. And the last name goes first and the first name uh, goes after. It, you can click that you want the exact name. I don't usually click that in case there's been any kind of misspellings, so I'm not going to check that off. So when I do my search, you'll see the next screen shows you my results. And I can click on any one of the case numbers to look at the results. Now the one that I'm going to look at first is going to be the bankruptcy. That's the most interesting to me in this particular due diligence search of David Dadon. My client wants to know if he should give David a quarter million dollars. I see there's been a bankruptcy. I need to look into that bankruptcy and uh, let my client know about it. So let's take a look at a district court case. Now when you look at the district court case docket sheet, there will be numbers for each one of the pleadings. If that number is blue and uh, has a link, you can click on it and you can immediately download or view that document on your computer. I always advise people to click on the complaint first. And as Mark said, these are only allegations. I don't know if everything in the complaint is true, but let's take a look at this complaint and see what it's all about. And I'm going to show it to my client because I'm sure that they'll want to know about it. So when we look at the complaint, this is a complaint by Smart Corporation. And as you can see, they are alleging securities fraud against David Dadon, breach of contract, common law fraud, aiding and abetting. Now we've looked at a lot of complaints online about David Dadon and they all have very similar themes. So that's definitely going on our no pile, right Mark? Oh yes. Oh yes. Now let's take a look at, at just the first, you know, maybe a page or so of this complaint. And you can see uh, point number 55 Smart Corporation alleges that Dadon fraudulently and deceitfully obtained converted shares of stock. Now, this is Smart Corporation. I always say to Mark, how smart was Smart Corporation? Because in this complaint, they allege they found 20 other lawsuits by other companies that allege similar uh, fraud um, by Dadon. And really, shouldn't Smart Corporation have done their due diligence first not after the fact, of course. And we're hoping that this seminar helps you uh, do that kind of research. Now, if you look at the next slide, this is called recap. What is recap? Well, take a look at the word recap. What is recap spelled backwards? PACER. So recap is actually a free database of selected PACER documents. Not everything is here. Um, I suggest you look at this and see if you can find the document you're looking for. And if you can, you might be able to download it for free. It's a project where anyone who uses PACER and then pays to download documents from PACER then automatically donates them to Recap. And you have to put a little plug in on your uh, computer in your browser if you want to be uh, take a part in this. However, if you just want to look at the documents and download them for free from Recap, you can do that. You don't have to put a plug on plug in on your computer. Now, if you look at the next slide, you'll see that my search results let me know uh, that I might have to um, I could download for free, and it'll basically say that it says the word download. That means it's free. It's here at Recap, or I might have to buy it from Pacer and they'll alert me to that. 
And also notice um, on the right hand side, I can set up an alert. So anytime a new document is added to this particular uh, case filing, I'll get an email alert from Recap. I can go online and I can pick it up for free. So it's a pretty uh, useful site. Now, Mark, I think maybe you want to talk a little bit about running uh, searches through Edgar. I do, and the reason that I'm looking at Edgar in particular to do background research about David Dano is that we've seen a number of instances where he has been involved with publicly held companies. Uh, aside from the order out of uh, Arizona barring him from operating publicly held companies, we've read numerous articles from numerous resources uh, showing us that Dadon has been involved with a number of public companies. So now we can go to Edgar and use their advanced search to run a search for David Dadon's name through all of the filings at the SEC for the last four years. And it's a rolling four years, and it's kind of interesting. Um, rather than being like uh, today, it's the, uh, the end of September of 2014, Oddly, rather than just running back to September 2010, it actually runs back to January 2010. Um, and then come, this, uh, come January 1, 2015, 2010 will fall off, and we will have access to the last four years of rolling filings at the SEC. Uh, back in the old days, if you wanted to search Edgar, you could only search by company name or ticker symbol. Uh, but now we have the ability to search full text through all the filings, and we are going to search for David Dadon to see where he's mentioned in company filings. When we do that, we find uh, this filing from a company called Brookmount. Um, now remember, uh, we saw earlier another filing where Dadon was listed as a plaintiff suing uh, Brookmount because he claimed that he was terminated from their board of directors without proper procedure. One of the issues with SEC filings, and if any of you have ever read them, you'll feel my pain, is that they're really long. Most of them are very, very long. Occasionally, you know, an 8K might be one page, but the quarterly filings tend to be very, very long. Now, if we're looking for information on a specific person, for example, or a specific topic, we can't, rather than scrolling through the pages and pages and pages of the filing, we can very quickly get to the point in the document where uh, the name or topic of interest for us lies. And we can do that by searching through the document using the find function of our browser. And we do that by pressing the control and F as in find key at the same time. Uh, if you're using a Mac, you would press the command and F key and it pops up this find box. And in that box, we can type the keyword or phrase that find uh, next it takes us directly to the place in the document where that name appears and we can continue to click the next 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 until we have exhausted all of the references to our that keyword in our document now we uh, we can read here in this section a little bit more about how the uh, suit uh, that Dadon filed uh, turned out. Uh, in fact, the company obtained a judgment against Dadon. Uh, they've been awarded a total of nearly $214,000 um, by the court. So this gives us a little bit more information about Dadon's relationship to Brookmount and how it all turned out. So we're going to put this in the no pile, uh, and then we're going to move that other SEC filing from Brookmount where he was listed as a plaintiff over to the no pile uh, because it, this is a clear indication that there were there were bumps in the road of their relationship, let's say. I want to talk now about a fairly new government website, and it's called FDSIS, and that stands for Federal Digital System. This particular database, I go into a lot of detail in my internet legal research on a budget book. So I'm just going to briefly give you information about it um, because it's, it's really a very detailed database. And using the federal, digit, federal digital system, I can do a simple search if I click on the box in the middle, and I will search all government documents. And when I say all, I mean government documents from all three branches of the federal government. Now, I can also do an advanced search if I click, and I can also retrieve by citation. So if I know a specific citation of a statute or a Code of Federal Regulations 
um, section, for instance. Now, the federal digital system does not have all of the federal court cases in it. They are adding them uh, continuously and maybe kind of slowly. So it's not the place where I'm going to go to do case law research. This is where I'm going to go to find information about uh, Congress and agencies and things like that. Um, so let's take a look at the next slide. Oh, and also you can browse. So if I wanted to browse the Code of Federal Regulations and I want to see what happened to do that, for instance. Now, in the next slide, you can see the advanced search screen, and it's very, very detailed. There's a lot of things you can do. Um, you can search by date. You can uh, choose different collections. I can search just one, or I can click on in multiple ones and then it adds it to the right side. I can click all collections together and at the very bottom I tell them where I want to put my keywords. Usually I'm going to choose full text and then I can enter keywords into the full text. Now I'm going to do a, a, a very broad search through all collections, all federal government documents and I'm really interested in learning more about how veterans had to wait to get appointments at the hospital and I heard about the secret waiting list and I have a client who wants to sue uh, a VA hospital or the entire um, department I suppose we'll see how it goes so I'm gonna just type in all those keywords and when I leave a space in between a word that means I'm using the boolean connector and so it's veterans and hospitals and appointments and I don't have to actually type the word and. Now at, in the next slide you'll see what my results look like. And, oh, I can also add five, four more search criteria. Um, so in the results list you can see all my results. I can narrow down my results on the left hand side to just a specific collection. Maybe I just want to see the congressional record. Or I can narrow it down to a date or an organization, et cetera, et cetera. I also can sort my results and I can uh, select by clicking on any of the links that look interesting to me. And I'm going to click on the congressional record link. I want to see what's going on in the congressional record. And when I do that, you'll see the next slide brings up the full text of the congressional record. I don't actually have to go to the congressional record and uh, do a search. It's right here for me. And my keywords are highlighted for me um, because I've used Mark's trick uh, control F, F is in find and you can see a little find box at the top I typed in the word secret waiting and it pops up the page that has that because the congressional record is thousands of pages I would have to scroll through uh, literally thousands of pages so I really want you guys to remember that great control F trick or command F if you're a Mac user. You can see that the little um, find box looks different than it looked on the one that we did at the SEC. So it really depends on your browser and, and a couple other things, but you'll see a little box pop up somewhere. Sometimes you'll even see it pop up on the left, like in a column. So keep your eyes open for where it's actually popping up. So let's do a little bit of um, free legal research for case law. And I'm going to talk about Case Maker, Fast Case, and Google Scholar. Now, almost every state except California and Delaware subscribe to either Case Maker or Fast Case and offer it for free to your to the members. So, if you are in a mandatory bar, you get free access automatically. If you're in a voluntary bar, you'll have to pay to join the bar, and then you'll get free access to these phenomenal these phenomenal databases for free. They both have web interfaces and they have app interfaces. So let's just take a quick look um, at these databases and see what we can do with them. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Uh, the first thing I want to know is do you have free access through your bar to CaseMaker? And I'd like to have you uh, vote on that. So take a moment for the poll and answer yes or no or I'm not sure because a lot of you might not be sure I encourage you to visit your bar association 
whether it's your state bar, your local bar, a specialty bar, and see if you have free access because it's not just the state bars that are offering this, these great databases. It's also this, the local and the specialty bars. Also, um, just for an example, the California State Bar does not offer uh, access to Casemaker or Fast Case, but the LA Law Library and the San Fernando Valley Bar Association offer free access to Fast Case, for instance. So let's take a look at the bowl, the poll, and see what kind of results we get. Okay, thank you, Carol. You're and welcome. And we have got our results. It looks like 28% yes. They do have uh, free access through their bar or another entity to Casemaker. 24% do not. And almost 50% say that they're not sure. Okay, so it's the not sure people that we're uh, encouraging to look on your bar's website and see if you actually have access. So I just want to show you um, one slide of Casemaker. And then, Mark, I think we should skip to, um, do you think we should skip to the Fast Case app after this? Okay. Because we're running a little bit low on time. So let's look at Casemaker first. We'll look at one or two slides. So when you look at Casemaker, you type your search in at the very top box, and you can see that all 50 states and federal are included in Casemaker. Um, let's take a look at the next slide, Mark, of Casemaker. And this is where I select what jurisdictions I want to search. I can search all federal, all state. I can search all of them together. Or I can mix and match. I can search the state of Alaska, and I could search the Board of Immigration Appeals. I mean, I can create any kind of jurisdictional uh, search that I want. And then let's look at one more Casemaker slide. And then this is everything you can do. You can change jurisdictions. You can search by citation or party or section or docket number. They give you search tips. You can do an advanced search, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they also have an app, but you have to actually have at Casemaker to use the app. FastCase gives you access to a free app, whether or not you, uh, your bar offers you FastCase, which is really very cool. I also want to say that if you like Casemaker or you like FastCase, you can subscribe to it. They have individual subscriptions if your bar does not give you uh, free access. So, um, Mark, I'm going to take a look. Uh, let's go to the FastCase poll question real quick. Oh, we were there already. You're so fast. And let me see. Who has free access to FastCase through your bar or another entity? Or who is already using FastCase, the app, for free on your mobile device? So let's take a couple seconds and have people answer this. I'm really curious to see how it compares to Casemaker. Great. And the answers are coming back very quickly. I'll go ahead and close the poll in just a moment. Okay. And let me just say that the FastCase app is not as full-blown as the FastCase web interface. It's, it's a lot smaller database. It's, it's a lot fewer search um, options, but it's still very useful if you have to look up a case or a statute very quickly. Uh, maybe you're in court, you want to look up something quick. Okay, and it looks like 43% said yes, 20% said no, and 37% are not sure. Okay, so for the 37% who are not sure, I will tell you that you have free access to the app, and you'll probably want to download it. It's really useful. So let's take a look at the next slide uh, very quickly. And this is what FastCase looks like if you're using it on the web or on your phone through the web. Oh, Mark, I think you skipped one too far. Okay, so we can use FastCase from any device at fastcase.com if we have access through our bar or if we have a, a, our own subscription. You enter your search in that top uh, search box if you click there, and you are going to search all jurisdictions. So Mark, you can uh, click, I think, on that, and they call this their quick case law search. Uh, it searches all jurisdictions, and it's searching cases only, not statutes, not regulations, just a quick case law search. And um, let's click again. If you want to search the advanced search, you would do that at the top. And you can see there's all kinds of um, help options, and there's all kinds of different databases to search besides case law. And then let's just look at the app really quickly, and then we'll, uh, in about a minute, we'll take questions. And if we don't have a lot of questions, maybe we can go back and look at the app a little bit more um, closely. 
but this is what the app looks like. You can search case law or statutes. If you're using FastCase on the web, you can search more. I think I showed you a minute ago, you can search regulations, AG opinions, all kinds of stuff. But the app is just a simple case law and statute search. And you can search it from an iPhone, an iPad, or an Android. Once again, it's free to anyone. You have to register to use it. You have to give them your email address and set up a password. The really cool thing about FastCase, if you have a subscription to FastCase through your bar or individually, you can actually sync your FastCase results between what you're doing on the web at your computer and when you go online or when you go to your mobile device, I should say, and use the app. So if I've saved something uh, from my computer, I'll see it on the app and I can rerun the search there. So I see that it's 1245. We have 15 minutes left uh, for anyone to ask questions. I'm going to take uh, a moment and let Stephanie let us know if we have any questions. And if not, we will continue on. Uh, we do have several questions. And would you like me to go ahead and start with the first one then? Yes, please. Okay, great. Um, how can I find out the identity of members of a California LLC? The question is, how can I find out members of the California LLC? You know, I haven't looked at California in a long time. Um, I used to live there. The Secretary of State has a corporations database, and off the top of my head, I'm not sure if LLCs are included there. I have a bad feeling they're not if you're asking me that question. So why don't you send me an email and I'll see if I can do a little bit more poking around. And I should say that not everything is free on the internet, not everything is even on the internet. Um, when I was a law librarian in California, we used to actually send runners to the Secretary of State's office and they would get documents for us. That is a possibility, I'm not sure at this moment. Okay, great. Um, and one attendee asks, please recommend a good California docket database. So the question is a good California docket database. Well, if you are looking for something free, the California courts do have docket databases, uh, the state courts, but they don't have the documents online. If you are looking for Los Angeles County in particular, the Los Angeles County um, courts have a docket database, but you have to pay to use it. It's very reasonable. Uh, the Los Angeles County Bar also has a docket database. You have to be a member of the bar to use it. And uh, then you get free access. If you're not a member of the bar and you are in a law firm that has more than one person, every single person in your bar, in your, excuse me, in your firm has to belong to get free access. You can pay for access. It's a little pricey. Now, Westlaw and Lexis and Bloomberg, all three of those are your major legal databases, and they have various state court docket databases. It's best to talk to your representative and find out what's available because it's really going to vary state to state and also even county to county. Okay, great. Um, Mary asks, how is the FD SIS different from Thomas.gov? Oh, that's a great question. How is it different than Thomas.gov? Thomas.gov has gone away. FDSIS is, and I should have said this, is the newcomer. So um, if you click on Thomas.gov, you'll probably be sent right over to um, FDSIS. It is no longer. And uh, thank you for that answer. We do have sure. a few questions um, about Google Scholar. OK. And um, I, I know that there was more in the presentation about Google Scholar if you wanted to. Yeah, so why don't we jump ahead on that. To, to Google Scholar and see if we answer some of those questions. Uh, it'll just be a second for me to uh, find the location of those slides in the presentation. They're pretty close to the end, I remember, after FastCase. And there's uh, a I need poll a slide question. number to be able to jump right to it. OK, 58 is the poll, I believe. There you have it. OK. Um, I don't know if you want to take the poll or if you just want me to jump into Google Scholar. Why don't we just jump right into it for now? OK. So Google Scholar is free. Uh, it has 
cases from federal and state government. The state cases go back to 1950. Federal uh, for the U.S. Supreme Court go back to the beginning of time, like 1754 or 59, something like that. Um, Google Scholar is horrible as to documentation. That's probably why you have a lot of questions for me. And I've written a big chapter in the Internet Legal Research on a Budget book about Google Scholar. They have no documentation on how to use case law. They have a little documentation on how to use the articles part of the database. And I want to mention that the articles part of the database is not just legal articles. It's uh, all subjects, medical, scientific, you name it. Um, some of the articles you have to pay for, actually many of the articles. So before you pay for an article on Google Scholar, use your library card, go to your library website and see if the articles are available there for free. So when you use Google Scholar, you actually have to click into the case law radio button as you see on the right side and then you can do your search. So let's click the next couple of buttons, Mark, and I'll show, point out a couple of things. So once you click on case law, then you see a second level uh, where you can click into the federal courts, the New Mexico courts, because I did a New Mexico court search recently. They'll always remember your last court, or I can select courts if I want to get very specific. Now, I can also do advanced searching if I click on the advanced search at the top. Now, I'm going to first click on jurisdictions, and I'm going to click what jurisdictions I want. And just like Fast Case and Casemaker, I can select all state courts, all federal courts. I can search all of them. I can pick and choose. I can search uh, Arizona State Court and the Second uh, Circuit Court of Appeals or the Tax Court, whatever I want. It's just, you. it's up to you, whatever you need. So after you click, um, after you click into what jurisdictions you want, click the Done button. Once you click the Done button, then you get taken back to a simple Google search screen, Google Scholar search screen. And you can enter your query into that screen. So you can go ahead and do that, but I think it makes a lot more sense to do an advanced search. So if you go over to the right next to that red, is that a bell, Mark? What would you say that is? It, it is a bell. That is a notification for updates from, uh, uh, usually from Google+. Plus. Uh, th that may be an indication of uh, other alerts for you, but click that down arrow. Um, it's not labeled. Uh, Google is famous for hiding really useful tools behind unlabeled uh, buttons and icons like this down arrow. One of the options on the drop down list is the advanced search for Google Scholar. So when you go to the advanced search, uh, it's going to look a little bit like the Google.com advanced search, at least the top part of it is. So I'm going to run a search, um, and I'm going to enter my words into all the words search box. And that means there'll be an and between each word automatically. I'm looking for a case involving Microsoft and Apple and the word copyright. And then I'm also going to enter the phrase trade secret. Now, I don't have to put it in quotation marks because I'm entering it into the phrase box. However, if I do more than one phrase in that box, then each phrase must have quotation marks around it. And then at the very bottom, I'm going to click the magnifying box to search, to run my search. And this is what the search results looks like. Um, on the left-hand side, you will see different ways for me to narrow or filter my search. I can say, you know, I really want articles about this, or I want case law only, or I want a specific court, I want Washington, or now I want to select a court and I want Arizona or California. I can also select a time, what case, uh, what date do I want the case to come from. Uh, notice too at the very bottom, I can create an alert. This is a completely different alert than the Google.com alerts that you might have set up previously. This will send me alerts based on my keywords and it'll set, send me alerts when a case uh, comes up with those keywords. So Google will continuously run my keywords in the jurisdiction I chose and send me an alert when there's new cases based on my keywords. Really um, very useful. And then if you take a look at the next slide, you'll see what the full text of the case looks like. You see that Google Scholar highlights cases for you. I can remove the highlighting if I want to print this out and not have yellow highlighting everywhere. And then notice there's a little button that says how cited. Now this is Google's sort of um, citation uh, product. It's a little bit like Shepard's or Keysight or Bloomberg's B site, but it's what I call a uh, light. It's light because it does not give you editorial treatment. It tells you what cases have cited your case, 
but it does not tell you if they've been affirmed or reversed or overruled or harmonized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So on the left-hand side, it gives you just a few cases about how other cases have cited to your case, and it gives you a little annotation, and you can click on it and read the full case. Now on the right side, it says cited by, and if you look at the bottom of that, it says 808 cases have cited your case. I would have to actually click on the 808. I would have to read each one of the cases to see how it treated my case. Okay, that's not going to happen. That's uh, going to take way too much time. Now, notice those little bars. Uh, there's three bars to the left of each one of those cases. And that means that that case has referenced your case and has referenced it maybe uh, a little bit more substantially than other cases. Sometimes you'll see two bars, and that means they've referenced your case to it, uh, but not quite as much as the three bar cases. And then you'll see one bar, and then you'll see no bars. No bars means they've cited your case, but they haven't talked about it um, at great length. And then the related means here's some documents that might relate to your topic, even if they haven't uh, included all of the keywords that you put in. So I'm going to stop for a moment. Um, we've got five more minutes. And I want to ask Stephanie if there are any other Google Scholar questions uh, that I could answer or other questions on some of the other sites we've talked about. Um, we have more questions than I've ever seen in a webinar. We have a lot more than we'll be able to get to today. I don't see anything specific to Google Scholar, um, but I, I do see a great question. If I'll go ahead and ask that one. Um, and that is from Alan. He asks, for factual-based research, have you run into any issues with admissibility of evidence? What best practices would you recommend to ensure evidence is admissible? That is a clearly a huge issue with information uh, found on the internet because uh, anybody can post anything on the internet at any time about anyone or anything or in the guise of anyone or anything. Um, and that's why it is uh, most important uh, when doing research on the internet, particularly fact-based fact research, to find corroborating sources either online uh, or in treatises or if possible through direct interview of uh, witnesses or your client. Mark, I think this comes up a lot with social media profiles. It does and, indeed. And in our CyberSleuth book we talk a little bit about how to get uh, that kind of evidence admitted, especially when they use pseudonyms. That's, you know, the, the trickiest. Um, we don't have a lot of time to get into that right now, but courts will often admit profiles into evidence where there's pseudonym, pseudonyms being used. Um, I want to also mention um, one more thing, and now it just slipped my mind. Okay, take over, Mark. We'll come back um, to you. I will also say <laughs> that uh, you'll, you'll want to uh, take note of sort of the, uh, like the, the steps reputation. You the, well, the first, the reputation of the site that you're relying on uh, to get the information. Uh, there are a number of ways to do that, um, either by name uh, or ownership. Uh, certainly, information that comes from a traditional news source um, might be more uh, reliable than information that comes from a blog. But if corroborated information from a blog can be just as correct and true. Um, Mark, I want to also mention that a lot of people rely on Wikipedia. And in the CyberSleuth's Guide to the Internet, I have cases where judges have admitted evidence from Wikipedia. I also have cases where judges have not admitted uh, evidence from Wikipedia. So feel free to email me if you want some of these citations. I think we might have some on our website uh, also. We do. We do. And also, I would say, as a best practice in terms of research, really research of any kind, document the steps that you take in the research process. I think Carol was just about to say that earlier, um, so that you can, uh, one, show that you have uh, there's no black line sort of um, standard of care when it comes to doing research. Like, how much should you look at? How many sites? How you know? How many cases do you have to read before you stop? The the notion of documenting really sort of covers that. I have made my best effort. I have gone through these steps and found this information. Another thing that can be very helpful uh, if you have support staff um, who has done this research. Uh, and I know Carol did this as a librarian at law firms often, she would... Uh, uh, I would run the searches, I would 
I would actually create an affidavit about what my steps exactly. were because you don't want the lawyer to have to get up and get on the stand and and you know give testimony in his own case. So um, right. So so that way the, the the support staff can affirm that these are the steps that they took and what you have presented as evidence is a true and correct copy of what they saw on that day at that time at that site. Okay, okay. well I think we have uh, just about run out of time unfortunately because we, we have so many great questions but we're going to be answering those on the blog.